Okay, so we're talking about the dry sump system. So you have to have an oil tank. Oil tank has may have a second outlet. Uh, I didn't write that. So two, three, black, um, a second, a second outlet below. below the normal outlet may be provided may be provided provided um, for prop governor prop governor oil um, to feather to feather prop Um, after a loss of all other oil, after a loss of all engine oil. Uh, let's see, some, let's go way down here. Oh, I forgot, I can't do that. You'll, you'll have kittens on me. All right, some aircraft, uh, what am I gonna say here? Oh, okay, oh yeah, some aircraft. Some aircraft, uh, and this would be like radials with a large oil supply. Use a hopper tank. Use a hopper. With a hopper tank. Or they may call it a temperature accelerating well. Some aircraft, radials with a large oil supply, for example, use a hopper tank or temperature accelerating well. And what that is, instead of having a tank that looks like this, let's see, we gotta make an inlet here. We'll make it over here. So the inlet comes over here, and it may look like, I'm just gonna kinda make it look like this, just cause I can, there we go. And the tank will be built up like this, like that. And then they'll put a bunch of little holes in here. So that was a screen? Yep, or holes. Not screens, but holes. Oh. All right, and so what happens is you start up the engine and you got cold oil, right? The whole thing is cold oil. And we'll let pink be hot oil, because that's cool. So warm oil from the engine is going to be returned down into here and it's going to fill this up and use this oil, continue to use this oil, but it will slowly radiate out the heat from this and start heating this other oil up and then pretty soon all the oil is warm and then the oil will flow through the little holes and get intermixed. Oh. Yeah, it's just so simple. It's just, but. So they use the viscosity of the oil? No, it's so that it doesn't take forever to warm up. You don't have to warm up five gallons of oil. Uh, you only have to warm up a couple oh, of quarts of oil. Oh, okay. And then slowly the oil around it is going to warm up because of that oil. It's going to mix a little bit and then it'll start flowing. And before you, you know, after a while, the whole thing is warm. Okay. And then the whole thing is flowing in and out of the oil holes. And, you know. yeah. It's just to help to produce more heat because if it's solid, it's going to take longer for the oil to warm, right? Right. The okay. Yeah, because if you didn't have, let's see, let's get rid of the temperature accelerating well. If we get rid of the temperature accelerating well, here we go. Now we have all of the cold oil, right? All this is cold oil. And the warm oil comes back, drip. Well, just warm oil here and here, and so it's just gonna take forever for it to warm up. You gotta warm up the whole tank. So by the time you get that tank warmed up, you're out of gas. <laughs> Good news, bad news. Oil's warm, but we're out of fuel. Uh, oh, I just had some other notes here. So I, I worked on Stearman's a lot. I like them. Boeing Stearman's. Uh, that's with a W670. That's really a small engine. That's a radial. That's a 220. 
Um, 670 cu cubic inch, 220 horsepower. Um, uses, I mean, that's one of the smallest radials, really. I think Kenners were smaller, but this is a common one that's pretty small. Uses six gallons or 24 quarts. 24 quarts of oil. So it takes quite a while. So the hopper, um, do I need to write this because I wrote such a good picture? Hopper is a well within the tank that allows smaller amount of oil to be used in the engine warm up. Engine and warm up. The warm oil then warms the remaining oil in the hopper. Warm oil in the main tank then flows into hopper through holes. Want me to write all that? Pictures worth a thousand. Right, thank you. That's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Continental's yeah, had the keeper. It, it really looked like I thought Pratt did too, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, all right, so number 13. My wife thought it was crazy that I labeled it that way and put it on the sketch, but she said, that's what you need more airplane <laughs> effects. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, Re required items. I think you have quite a few, uh, quite a few Q and A's. And some of them deal with what is required for oil systems. And I want to say there's been some significant changes in FAR 23 that have not caught up yet with the Q&A questions. They're still questioning you because it's funny. When I go back to reference some of this stuff, it's like no longer there. And there's, there's more of this push. And this really happened with uh, light sport where they're not certified by the FAA under the, the typical what we think of where, you know, you build an aircraft and you have a type certificate data sheet and the FAA comes out and you, does everything conform to this FAR and that FAR and that FAR. They're actually done under, what is it? It's not SAE. Um, ASTM, I believe it. I just lost it. Well, it's, you know, one of those things. But anyway, it's, uh, it's an automotive type thing where basically it's made under... Um, if it makes sense and you say it's safe as the manufacturer and you're willing to stand behind it and take the liability for it, then by all means, go ahead. Which means they can start changing a lot of things. You know, like on here, um, required items. Tank must have an expansion space of 10%, or I'll write this, or one half gallon, whichever is more. While well, you're building a light sport and you say, well, under these, um, um, under, under this, this spec that we're building it to, I, ISO? Yeah. Um, we feel that we don't need this uh, 10 percent or half gallon we feel that a quarter uh, gallon is more than adequate for what we've got going on and the fa is certifying it or you know the certifying agency is just going to say well okay you're you're the builder if, if you say so that sounds like the 737 max probably <laughs> <laughs> um yeah to a point yeah um damn that's bugging me um so um light sport they weren't trained though even though we didn't built to what spec? I don't think that's the right thing to do. Um, yeah, maybe you, it'll come to me or somebody else can find it. I know, it's already bugging me and I'm like, this is really a rabbit trail. I don't need to go down. I even talk about light sport. All right, so, but I believe that these Q&A still exist. So tank, tank must have. And I really hate that they would even ask you. You're not engineering this. You're working on it. You're fixing it. And if you're doing your job right, you're going to take out whatever tank is there and put in one just like it if it's a problem. An expansion space. of 10% or one half gallon. Whichever is more um, to account for expansion. Um, let me see. 
No, it's what it's what rule is it? What standard are they built to? Okay. Like ours are built to FARs. Do you know? No. Thought you had your hand up. Uh, let's see. Expansion space must be protected from. It is ASTM? Because that's what I said. But I typed I in light sport aircraft standard. Yeah. And automatically change it to ASTM. That's what I, okay, that was it then. Aircraft. Yep. There you go, Michael. Good job, Michael. Thank you. A little bit of props me for saying ASTM. But. <laughs> what ASTM stands for? <laughs> no, it does not stand for aviation. American Society for Testing Materials. Well, that's kind of what threw me off because that's that's NDT stuff, but also is it ASTM? I just don't feel like that's. Yeah, you're getting tested. That's part of your. That's part of your grade. I was more nervous. Like, okay, thanks for showing me, but now you've got a project to do because you had your phone out in class. No. Let me see. ASTM. You sure about that? And light sport. And light sport standards. Yeah, okay, I was right. So yeah, ASTM standards. Which means you get away from actually using AN hardware as long as it meets ASTM standards. Wow. Some, of it, some of that sounds good, but some of it doesn't sound good. I know. Yeah. But if you look at, you know, light sport's doing okay, so. Uh, <laughs> All right, what was I going to say? Expansion space must be protected from overfilling. Space must be protected from overfilling. In other words, a mechanic just dumping all the oil in, so there is no expansion space. Um, overfill. Uh, overfill by use of neck. in the tank. Uh, let me see. We got an event. Whoa, did I write too much. Each tank must be vented to the engine from the top part of the expansion space so the vent connection is not covered by oil. Oil tank must be arranged so the con condensed water vapor might freeze and obstruct the line, cannot accumulate. For aerobatic category airplanes, it must be means to prevent hazardous loss of oil during aerobatic maneuvers, including short periods of inverted flight. So vent, let me see. Um, it's vented to the engine. Vented to, vented to engine. From top. Um, B, water will not freeze. The vent, so you got to be protected from that, and no oil loss for aerobatic engines. There, we abbreviated the heck out of that. Water will not yeah, if you get water near the vent, it's on the top. The water won't freeze up and block the vent. Oh. Freeze there and block. How's that? Uh, a cap with the words or word oil and grade, what grade oil or reference to grade. Um, you're right. It does say, it. and I believe this is one of the FARs that is not there anymore. Okay. Which, so I wouldn't even bring it up otherwise, but, so, yeah, okay, so I'll, just to make sure you're not confused, okay, the word oil, because you're right, the Q&A says that. Um, I'll just put usually, um, grade or reference to grade nearby. A lot of planes pull a sticker on the oil door. 
to service this aircraft with uh, oil in accordance with the POH or something like that. What's that? I think the CJ fours, which are older aircraft. Which one's older? Than All right. Talk about the outlet of the oil tank. No screens. No screens that can uh, restrict flow. That's a bad thing. And outlet diameter. of the tank is not smaller than oil pump inlet because that's just a bad design. So that covers your Q&A's about what about the oil tank. adjusting my outline as I go. This is going to be a disaster. That was 13. No, I got four. Yeah, one, two, four. Way out here now. This will be point 14. We'll talk about the oil temp gauge. Oil temp gauge. Huh? <laughs> yep. Say oil temp, this is an important point, is taken, is taken as oil enters, enters the engine. And that's an important point because if I take my oil temp and it's 200 degrees, it is entering the engine. What's the oil going to do from there? Yeah. It's going to get hotter from there. So you're seeing it at about the coldest point. And I'm, I'm guessing when they all got together, maybe they tried it at the other end. I thought, no, 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 that's just making mechanic, uh, pilots poop. So we don't want to do that. Let's just, uh, we got to cool it down here. So uh, we'll take it where it's cold. Ah, sounds like a good plan. So oil temp should be um, 180 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's an important point because, well, I'll finish these two and then it all comes together. Max oil temp, max oil temp is about 240 degrees. And the engine adds 50, yeah, 50 degrees. So if we kind of put that together, we have some important things to think about. So oil temp should be 180 to 200. Well, why, why not 160? Why not 140, 150? I mean, wouldn't it be better if I could get it to run cooler? No. Why not? Well, how about the differential in your car? You have a rear wheel drive. That has lubrication in it, oil, gear. How hot does that get? Does it get pretty hot? Does it get that hot? I never measured it. It can, yeah. All right. I'm trying to think of something that runs cold with cold oil. It works. Oil works fine cold. The uh, water in there evaporates too cold. You got it. So you're going to be collecting water inside the oil and you want to burn off that water. So it's really important. And if you're getting 50 degrees added to it, 180 plus 50. 230. So we're getting above 212. So we're going to boil off the water. So that's why it's real important. And that's why I told you the story. I'm sure I've mentioned it many times about people going down the airport. You know, when I worked down at Clarksburg, you know, it's a grass runway. When the uh, levees get really high, it kind of seeps through. And so half the runway is kind of really wet. So people weren't using it. Then the Thule fog rolls in for months in an end. And people just come out there and, you know, it's just solid IFR. You can't fly off a grass strip in IFR. There's no controllers. So they would just go out there. Oh, I'm just out here to run the plane up, you know, just 
go out there and just kind of run it for a little while and shut down, you know, oh, there we go, you know, and they never get the oil hot enough. So you expand the air, the engine cools off and sucks in more water. Yep. <laughs> so you're better off doing nothing. Yeah. So if the engine's going to add 50, why is the oil temp should be between 180 and 200? Because if that 200 is add 50, it's going to be higher than the max oil temp. Uh, that's just, yeah, uh, no. So max oil temp is 240 going in. Okay, okay. 290 coming out. Okay, I'll say that. Yeah. All right, cool. So inside the engine, you're going to get another 50. I'll put at gauge. At gauge. At gauge. And if, if the engine's adding more than 50, hypothetically, something is terrible. I would think so. Yeah, yeah. Something's getting a little warm in there. <laughs> but you wouldn't know. Right. You don't know what it adds. All you can read is this max oil temp. Well, yeah. unless I mark P and M and D right. and T. Right. Or, or if you know. But, <laughs> but you don't know. I don't know, I think. <laughs> you don't really know how much your engine is adding. You just don't. All you yeah. can know is that it's, your, your oil temp's 240. That's too hot. So you gotta, you got to cool down a little bit. Uh, let me see. All right, 14. We'll make this 15. Um, the oil pump. Oh, I know why it's not stuck, because we're still really, you know, I kind of go in and out of talking about... Oil pump, pressure pump? Pressure pump. I, I have pressure pump here. Oil pump. I apologize. I'm really talking mostly about the wet sump engine still, but some of this really applies to both. So it's, so I'm gonna go in and out of that, sorry. So the oil temp, that's all engines. The pressure pump's gonna be all engines. Um, the oil uh, required items for the um, oil tank, and it's a dry sump because you don't have an oil tank on a wet sump, right? Uh, but um, your cap, that's applicable to both. Uh, pressure pump, so applicable to both. Uh, let me see. Is it gear driven? Come on, help me out. Gear driven? Positive, Positive displacement. displacement. Positive displacement. Pump. All right. It uh, constants displacement because why? Same amount per rotation. All right, so I think I kind of wrote this. Sucks oil from tank. Sucks oil from tank. Um, and then every now and then I throw in a really good thing. I'm like, oh, that's right. Um, leaks. Leaks in oil pump. Will suck air. If you got a leaky gasket, like where your oil pickup tube is that you guys are installing now, and that gasket's bad, it'll suck air right there. I mean, the pump just wants to suck in stuff. I know that's not proper physics to say it oh, sucks yeah. it in, but um, doesn't care. Doesn't doesn't care one bit. It just wants to pump stuff. Yeah, you got oil, I'll pump oil. You got air, I'll do air. You got fuel, I'll pump fuel. Hydraulic fluid, you got it. Doesn't care. You know, shove banana in there, it's, it goes too. Yep. So the pressure gauge. Pressure gauge in the airplane reads what? Pressure. pressure. Reads pressure. So if you have a big air leak, air leak, you read air pressure. not oil pressure. So you're just pumping air. And that's not a good thing, but it's lying to you. The gauge is saying, yeah, you got 40 PSI. It just happens to be air. Sorry about that. Normal oil pressure. I say, so what do you do with that information? Well, you make sure that your gaskets are good and everything is tight and you don't walk away from something and the oil lines are tight. It's all about doing it right. Normal oil pressure, uh, about 
and it depends on the engine about 15 to 20 psi idle and about 60 to 115 at cruise But again, that's going to depend on the engine. Mine's a little bit lower than that at idle and not quite that high at cruise. So how do you know what is normal for an airplane? Um, think about that one. If you're breaking in an engine on a test stand, then it's going to be the engine manual. Once it's put on an aircraft, it's the aircraft manual. Uh, and it's going to be in the pilot operating handbook. And in fact, part of doing an annual inspection, for me, the first time that I do one on an aircraft that I haven't, they're not familiar with, is I'm going to get out the pilot operating handbook, POH, and I'm going to go to placards, and I'm going to verify every single one. It's going to say the pilot operating handbook, green arc, oil temp, between this and this. And I go, yep, that's correct. You'd be surprised how many times it's completely wrong. It's like, tack, red line in here, I'm like, that's not right. Hey, that's not right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> People just put in stuff, you know? Placards and such. Oh, gosh, takes forever. Um, oil, this is still continuing. Oil travels around outside a pump. Not through the center. Would you say the pump peak? Like the pump gears? Well, the gears go through the middle too. So I want to make sure it goes around the outside and not through the middle. Uh, around the outside, around the outside. <laughs> uh, the pump is designed. To pump, pump more oil than the engine needs. So, what do you do with the extra? Now, what happens? What number am I on? You're on 16. 16? Okay. So, therefore, we need an oil pressure relief valve. So, if there's one thing I wish that I could convey easily to you is this pressure and pump relationship. Because while I'm going to talk about it now, you live and die by it in the next eight weeks. And it just, it, it's very hard for me to see somebody who just can't get the two to mesh because you'll never understand anything that we're going to talk about in the next eight week class. Everything will just be whoosh, I don't get it. So a pump does not pump pressure. You can write that down just because I don't write stuff down doesn't mean you can't. A pump does not pump pressure. A pump pumps volume. Should write that down. Pump does not pump pressure, pump pumps volume. So it is going to put out a certain amount of oil. And it doesn't know anything about pressure. So if I look at this particular slide right here, and I kind of talk about it, maybe you can get some thoughts. If I were to get rid of all of this stuff, and it was just an outlet right here, just an outlet, we'll just there, just dump it out. And I put a little pressure gauge right here. Here's my pressure gauge, PSI. What would the pressure be? It would be zero. It would be zero. Well, what if I ran the pump faster? It would be zero. It would just continue. And I could run it until the thing is starting to, centrifugal force is starting to take the gears and stretch them out to the point where they're, you know, it's 20,000 RPM. And my pressure would be? 
zero. And it's always going to be zero. But what's going to happen to the volume? It's going to go more and more. And pretty soon, I'm emptying out a, an Olympic-sized swimming pool every, every 10 seconds because I'm spinning it so fast, right? But my pressure is still pretty much at zero. So it's because a pump pumps volume. It doesn't pump pressure. It doesn't know. It doesn't care. And, and so well, where do we get the pressure from? Restrictions. It takes a restriction to make pressure. So if I try to make this a little more simplistic here, and we'll just kind of get rid of all this, like that's not there. And well, we'll just go back to what I had. We'll just do something like this where it kind of dumps it out this way so it's nice and clean. All right, so we just talked about the same thing. I can, I can put a pressure gauge over here and I can look at the pressure and it's pretty much gonna be zero the whole time because there's just no restriction, right? But if I take this and I put a restriction right here, now what happens? All right, so let's run it at like kind of a normal speed. And because we have an orifice, a restriction, there's going to be some pressure. And then of course, it's gonna depend on how fast I'm doing the pump versus how big the restriction is. But, you know, let's just say it's just at such a size that um, it's giving me 50 PSI. Well, okay, so it's at 50, oh, right here, 50. Now, what happens if I speed the pump up? The pressure's gonna go up. I'm feeling bad because uh, Andrea's starting to, starting to lose her. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> it's all right. Shh. It's okay. I, I feel bad, though, because I feel like I'm boring her, but it's okay. I know. You, she works hard. Um, so I was going to say, by the way, it, that's always been my policy. If you fall asleep, don't worry about it. Um, um, okay, so if I spin the pump faster, pressure's going to go. <laughs> pressure's going to go. Uh, 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 then I spin it even faster. It's going to go uh, up. It's going to be going up and up and up. Okay. I spin it slower. Starts going down and down. And now I'm just barely spinning it. What's going to happen? It's going to go down and not hardly vary anything. Hardly vary anything. That was just a brilliantly said. I should be a writer. So it's going to go way, way down. So, okay. So I, hopefully that just conveys to you that it's all about this orifice, right? So now we're, we're back. We're running it at a steady RPM. It's a high RPM. I got my 50 PSI right there. <laughs> and I take and I close up the restriction a little bit. Okay, pressure goes up. And then I take and I say, all right, well, I'm going to get rid of some of that restriction. And now the pressure is going to down. go down. All right. And I never change the speed of the pump. I just change the orifice. Pressure goes up, open the orifice, down. pressure goes down. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. It's so important that you get that. It's not just like a today thing. It's like, it, it has to be there for the next class to make any sense at all. Yeah. Does the velocity of the oil change? Like, like talking like, I don't know, thinking of like last class that I was in, when you had a restriction, the velocity yeah, I guess it Oh, across the restriction? Yeah. Well, yeah, because you still have the Venturi effect, but it's not important to this at all. It doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. does not. All right. Uh, where was I? Oil pressure relief valve. Okay, we're talking about the oil pressure relief valve. So we're going to talk about this thing right here. So the whole point is the, the, oil, the pump is pumping more oil than it needs to the engine. It goes through the filter. It's filtered. It goes to this little poppet valve. It goes out to the engine. It's going to go to the bearings. It's going to go to the, you know, to the galleries, then to the bearings, and to the, the tappets, right? All that stuff. And if the engine is set, let's say we're running it at uh, 2,200 RPM, and it's warm, and all things are normal, and I look over, and the oil pressure, we'll just keep using that number because it's right in the middle, 50, and everything's at 50, right? And that's where I want it. But now I say, well, shoot, I'm going to really open this thing up. I just increase the RPM. Go firewall this thing, bring the prop all the way forward, and I run it all the way up to red line. What's the pump going to be doing? Same or faster? faster? Does that mean it pumps more or less or the same? The same. It's the same for revolution. Per revolution, but I told you I just increased the RPM by a lot. It's got to pump more pressure. So what's the oil pressure going to do? Okay, it should increase, but I don't want it to. Because let's say I wanted to hold it at 50. 
So something's got to give. So what gives? You open up an orifice. You make the orifice bigger. Now, the entire engine itself is an orifice. All those little tiny passages it has to go through adds up to an orifice. And if I want the pressure to remain the same and I speed up the pump, then I have to open up those orifices. Well, I can't really go in there and scrape out some of the bearings, so we just create an orifice that's going to open up a little bit. Now, granted, this isn't a very smart relief valve because I don't want to complicate things, but the more you open it, the more you press on the spring, the harder it is to open it. So it's not exactly linear, so it could go 50, 55, 60, but it won't go past 60. You know, you can't expect it to hold that 50 because hopefully you can see that. As you push it this way, the spring is going to get more tension and then it's going to not want to open. It takes more pressure to get it to open more. But so the oil then, instead of going out to the engine, it's going to find its way through here and go through the bypass. And we say back to the inlet side of the pump. Now, maybe it goes right here to the literal inside of uh, um, that return side of the pump. Usually it goes down that little hole and falls into the oil tank or the sump. Then it's gone through the pickup tube and back to the inlet side of the pump. But it doesn't matter. Even if it falls through the whole engine, it's sprayed here. It goes past these little, this area right here where you have front of your safety wire. And it goes into the sump. We still say it goes back to the inlet side of the pump. Inlet side of the pump. It's just what we say. It doesn't always mean literally to the inlet side. It's back to the sump, which is on the inlet side of the pump. All right, so that's what the oil relief does. I hope that made sense, because I sure have tried. All right, oil pressure relief. Um, so excess. Excess oil is relieved by an oil pressure relief valve and routed back to the pump inlet. So ex e -X -C -E -X excess oil is relieved. Relieved by an oil pressure relief. valve and routed back to the inlet side of the pump. You dropped that. Um, so this is a relief. This is a relief, not a regulator. Um, and, and by that, what I'm talking about is like on, on my air compressor at home, you know, I've got a, a regulator and I set it and I want 50 pounds out. Well, that's what's going to output 50 pounds. And I can have 110 in my air tank or I can have 60 in my air tank, but the output is 50. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't depend on what's on the other side. So this isn't something that's like smart and goes, ooh, you know, we've got to have 50. Huh? Yeah. It's safe to say like, so when you have oil in the system, and say you spring a leak, you have a certain amount of pressure going in. You're safe to say you spring a leak that would travel to the least path resistance. Path of least resistance. Yeah. I you know it's kind of I almost said that, um, but then I didn't. But it's not wrong to say that. Yeah, you can say that. It's going to find the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. Except that I want to say we talk about one thing. It's it's easy to say that it doesn't because it goes everywhere. So even though it's easier to go through the relief valve, it will also go through the rest of the engine. It still flows throughout. Still the flows everywhere. It's not like electricity where it just all dumped through that. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if relief relief sticks open sticks open, then the engine will not have oil pressure. And the tappets don't have oil, and the bearings don't have oil, and it's going to go ticky, 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 and then it's going to squeal, and then it's going to stop. Um, so the relief is a ball, which you know, or a valve, or a valve that sits on a seat, um, spring pressure
spring pressure keeps the valve keeps valve uh, closed <laughs> until what's that until until oil pressure until oil pressure um, overcomes spring and unseats the valve uh, this can be a really bad thing because Oil tends to take the path of least resistance. <laughs> and if your oil is really cold and it's supposed to go out to the galleries and through all those very small little spaces, but it's really cold and it won't flow that way, but it'll flow real nice through the oil pressure relief valve. It'll go through the oil pressure relief valve and dump. And you're going to see, yeah, you're going to see, look, I got 50 PSI or I got 100 PSI, but it doesn't mean it's flowing to the engine. It's just in that particular line, perhaps. Depends on where the oil pressure is taken. Like my engine, it's taken off one of the gallery, so it's got to go through and then down in the engine and then back. So, so you do have to be careful with that. Um, oil pressure is adjusted. Oil pressure is adjusted. Adjusted on a hot engine. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that you have to you can't add washers or you can't adjust the spring unless it's hot but don't reference it to a cold engine in other words if a pilot says hey i you know i i got low oil pressure i'd like you to adjust a little bit first question is why what happened you know verify all that but if you make the decision that yes we're going to bump up the oil pressure a little bit on this it's fine if you do it in the morning when the engine's ice cold and say well i'm just going to give it a couple two or three turns of this or i'm going to add two washers or whatever you're going to do put it together cold then say now we'll take it out warm it up and, and see what it does but you wouldn't ever adjust it while it's cold and then verify it while it's cold and then call it good because it's going to be really high when, when my engine's cold my oil pressure's it's pegged almost all the way to the right side so it is really high i know um so when cold when cold um oil uh, oil pressure may be high pressure may be high. Oh, it will be actually. Oil pressure is always lower at idle. So oil pressures is lower. It just is not supposed to be, but it just is lower at idle. So if somebody came to you and said, well, I got this problem with my airplane. I'm very concerned about it. You know, I started up in the morning, it's cold, and, it, and it's just all the way to the top of the green. I mean, it was like, wow, it's really good. It's, it's too high. And I wait, and I warm it up a little bit. As soon as the engine starts getting warm, it starts coming down. And then I take off, and I fly it for about five, ten minutes. I look over, and it's right in the middle of the green. And it stays there the whole flight, but man, as soon as I touch down and I pull it back to idle, boom, it falls out of the green almost all the way down to near zero. Uh, what do I do? That's good. Enjoy, enjoy your airplane. That's what you, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's going to really cost you. What going to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you got a you got a spark tube has gone out. Probably your Johnson rod thing is going to all twisted and it's got a. Your dingle tube. <laughs> Uh, so it's adjusted, adjusted by a screw that presses in on the spring or adding washers, depends on the type, or adding <coughs> washers. Now make sure you understand, I just want to make sure, because I'm starting to figure this out. When I say add washers, you got to put the washers inside of here so that there's more pressure on the spring. I just fear I'm going to come out and these, this is an AM900 washer. And I'll see them stacked all the way like that. And you're like, well, I added, 
Oh, and now, oh, and now there's only like one thread engaging, and I still can't get enough oil pressure. <laughs> what would that do? Drop it. What would that do? The oil pressure. Drop it more. Drop it more because yeah, you're taking pressure off the spring. So. Really want to get Kevin mad. Use the channel lock. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I torqued it with the. How do you torque with the channel lock, Kevin? I just got it as tight as I could. There is a maximum. The maximum number of washers allowed. Five foot pounds. You know. One. <laughs> Got as tight as I could. Two. What is the absolute tightest you can get anything in the world? Uh, tightest loose and quarter turn. Quarter turn, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you guys get that's a joke, don't do it. <laughs> Tighten it till it gets loose, then back it off a quarter turn. We didn't think it was a joke. Okay, <laughs> I know. <laughs> it would have been funny if I'd remember that when that broke off. I said, I'll just back it off a quarter. Um, let's see, Max. Max number of washers allowed. If you exceed the number of washers, there are heavier springs that you can use. Uh, let's see, troubleshooting. Oh, this is the part I really like. Because, you know, that's what this is really all about. you got to learn the theory because anybody, well, not anybody, it's one thing to go out there and just, you know, R&R &R something or, you know, their procedures and you just kind of do a monkey thing and, you know, it's, well, turn this screw, pull that off, push this on. But the real... The real money is made by mechanics who can look at something, hear about problems, and go, I understand that because I understand the whole system and now I can troubleshoot it. So, troubleshooting. Um, what was the maximum number of washers? I don't remember. Okay. Yeah, no, it doesn't. It's in Lycoming, they okay. tell you. I just didn't. I don't know offhand. All right, so let me see. If, so if you suspect an oil problem, this is what, what Lycoming wants you to do. If an oil gauge, an oil gauge is installed, installed um, at pump outlet, at pump outlet, outlet, and the end of the last gallery and of the last gallery. So what does that mean? So I've got to, I'm trying to troubleshoot oil. Do you have an oil pressure problem or do you have a gauge problem or something else? So I need to get some gauges and I want to check them out. I guess it's almost time to go. It yeah, it is. So this is a good place to start tomorrow. Oh, all right. 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 Oh, all right.